Okay, folks, this is uh, AI First Engineering, and we're doing the health and medicine AI section. And uh, here we're looking at uh, various approaches from a data science or a computational science, or just AI algorithm point of view uh, to tackle the coronavirus. Most of these projects are ones I'm some, my research areas are somewhat nearer than the ones in the previous section. So Rosetta at Home is a well-known project. Um, it, there is a link here from HPC Wire, which is a dominant HPC uh, uh, newsletter. And it is um, an interesting technology. It's called volunteer computing. You imagine the world's uh, computers, and you allow the world's computers to download jobs and solve them. So this works under two circumstances. One, the jobs don't have huge amounts of input data. Two, the jobs don't take huge amounts of time. And three, that's most important, there's no communication needed. The jobs just sit there and do their own thing. Because once you start communicating between computers on the internet, you have huge overheads between communication on computers and clusters. And um, there was a protein prediction server, and basically they're looking at this idea of um, trying to understand which drugs could actually match well the, um, the virus. And um, I don't know that we have that much detail on the um, coronavirus application of Rosetta at home, but it has 100,000 hosts for its general tasks, and 100, so that's 1.26 petaflops of computing. And as I said, these are pretty reasonable at computing, but uh, they have to have the right size job and no communication. So it's important, it just is limited. But limited important things are very important, because as long as what they're limited to is important, which in this case it is. All right, here we have this uh, announcement of an HPC consortium, which I already mentioned. Now we have 330 petaflops. Uh, I'm not certain that they're going to devote that to all to, to virus research, but uh, this is just the standard leaders in big computing companies like IBM and Amazon and Google and Microsoft and HP and lots of some academic places. And uh, but also the DOE and uh, national labs and also NSF and NASA have major computer supercomputer facilities. And um, there is a discussion here of how the Summit supercomputer, which is a DOE supercomputer at Oak Ridge National Lab, and the, the, the most powerful relevant one at the moment because it has lots of GPUs. Um, and um, you see you have six times 4608 GPUs, that's a lot. I'm told that uh, at the time, NVIDIA gave a good price to Oak Ridge on their GPUs, because it gave NVIDIA a very uh, strong publicity boost at the beginning of the V100. Nowadays, I'm told you can't get such good deals, because v 100s well established. All right, then each of those knows actually is an IBM CPU. Here we have um, a comment about an, a company doing something similar. Um, it's identifying possible drugs and uh, they have one using in this case here some uh, generative adverse or serial networks, which are natural things to use because they generate. Given one example, they generate related examples. Uh, what we heard about on the previous slides was seeing if a particular drug was useful. Here, we're generating example drugs. And uh, presumably, they also have to be run through this testing to see whether they really do address the virus. And there are many such, there's a lot of work of this type. And I'm doubt of what we have here, which is Michigan State and um, and Gilead, is a very significant summary of the uh, uh, what's available. Here we have a, a 
a medium article which runs through a bunch of um, algorithms and data sets. It points out that uh, Kegel has a significant data set. Uh, there's a set from Montreal of CT scans. There's the well known John Hopkins uh, dashboard and back end GitHub, which has lots and lots of daily uh, COVID results. Um, and uh, obviously, there are lots of other data sets typically not available. Um, here is just uh, this particular article's identification is uh, of our article. So here we have an image processing article. We know that will succeed. Um, patient monitoring, gain using image analysis, uh, respiratory analysis. These are gain. These are classification problems to decide whether a particular respiratory um, signature is a problem or not. So that should be good for deep learning. We actually heard about some examples like that uh, in the earlier slides of this uh, uh, of this uh, unit. Um, pneumonia um, versus uh, the, this looks at pneumonia, which is presumably going to be image based, and it compares flu versus COVID. Um, and here we have. Uh, a somewhat different AI system which looks at the EHR itself and looks at the various uh, data there to see uh, how severe the infection would be. And unfortunately, it's more than 90% accurate in predicting when people have a deadly infection. Yeah, I don't really want to go into this. This is just a collection from the local biology experts of relevant biology papers uh, telling you about the virus. Um, and the parts of the human body that the virus attacks. Okay, here's now some sections I understand. My friend Medaf Marath at the University of Virginia uh, is defining here this very important field of computational epidemiology. And it is basically developing and using computer models, which just study the spread of the disease, which is called spatiotemporal diffusion. Well, so what does that mean? You have a bunch of people and places, they move around in time, and, uh, and then they, as they interact, they spread the disease. These are the types of studies that are being used to order you to social distance. Um, and I, I, I may be wrong, I think social distancing is a new term. I don't remember it being used in the past. And I have sort of vaguely studied this field for some time. I have not seen that term used much. But it's obvious, it's a very important term. Um, and it does, and they can do all sorts of variants of this model with different degrees of sophistication. And um, they actually model the movement of the people and um, and the, and the fold in the probability of tra transferring the virus, and then the probability that virus will infect somebody. Okay, so that's that. And these are some of the questions that you can try to answer with computational epidemiology. Is um, what's the, about the infection? Where did it outbreak? There's a lot of study these days because although the outbreak was associated with a so-called wet market in Wuhan, actually it's not been clear. It's not clear that it actually came from that. Maybe somebody with the virus took it to the. I mean, accidentally, where happened to go to the market and then it jumped to other people there. The huge number of the early. Um, Ill people, uh, people with the virus came from that market, but some actually patient zero. At the time when I do these lectures, patient zero did not come from the market. Um, then you have a chance of getting a particular disease in the U.S. We know Ebola ravaged Africa, but hasn't ravaged the U.S. We can compare quantitatively different outbreaks and study the con how contagious it is and how it progresses, how it's treated, and where the disease comes from. And this is. Say so there's a study whether it comes from bats, snakes, pangolins. There's this sad little animal I haven't heard of before, which is meant to have a, 
uh, be a host of a closely related virus. Um, and you can either do these as sort of a classic physics field model, um, but uh, those make assumptions. So the usual way to do it in a, for a precise study is, a, is this event-based model or agent-based model, uh, which has to build in the interaction between the people. And then you have networks between these people. And the networks for the study of a particular diseases is different, because they're in different places. The people interact in very different ways. And uh, the end result is a policy. You want to know what the president should announce at his daily press briefing. Um, and these uh, decisions need to be made in a timely fashion. There's an interesting difference in real time, which is what you have to have in your self-driving car when it's trying to avoid collision. That is real time. It, these are timely. You want the results, say, within hours of when the, the data comes out. And uh, this particular group uses 10,000 core hours per day, uh, just looking at this uh, model evolution. Here's a second type of interaction we'll come back to from my colleague James Glazier and uh, Paul Macklin, who are leaders in this field, is to um, actually build a model for what's uh, for the what happens in your body when um, when the virus gets into it, and so you need to build a, a a model for a cell, a model for a virus. You need to need a model for an immune cell which will gobble up the virus, and maybe a model for the drug which will gobble up the virus. In each case, the gobblers up might gobble up things you don't want gobbled up, so you have to have a model for that. And so this is important, uh, as we'll describe later, complex system simulation. And um, we need it's obviously important because it will give you insights into um, how best to tackle the, the disease. Also, uh, if you take this, these models and combine it with some generic treatment, you can look at personalized data and personalize the model to individuals by using some deep learning approach, which uh, mixes the data and the model. You train the deep learning on the model and you modify it with the data. Uh, James Glazier has um, CompuCell 3D, Paul Macklin has PhysiCell. These are each are built around agents, which represent the fundamental entities from which the model is built. We'll describe why you have to use agents later on. And here's Macklin's, uh, which is just a set of links. He has an actual model, initial model for the virus. It has a GitHub, and he has a preprint describing it. So this field is moving real, real fast. Thank you.